Hi, everyone. It's Doreen. And today's topic is something I've been praying a lot about. And we are so blessed to be joined today by Dr. Scott Aniel. He's the executive vice president and editor in chief of G3 Ministries. He's also a professor of pastoral theology at Grace Bible Theological Seminary. He's a teacher of culture, worship, aesthetics, and church ministry philosophy. And he also lectures around the country in churches, conferences, colleges, and seminaries. He's the author of several books. I think he has 11 books out, including Changed from Glory into Glory and Biblical Foundations of Corporate Worship. He's also written dozens of articles and his weekly podcast, which I highly recommend, is called By the Waters of Babylon. Dr. Annual holds a master's degree in theological studies and a PhD in worship ministry from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Annual's website is scottannual.com. The link to his website and his podcast and his social media is in the description below. You'll definitely want to check out his work. So this interview started on April 25th when Dr. Annual posted on social media, maybe you saw this because it went viral, he posted this, don't give in and watch the chosen. Your imagination will forever be shaped by the visceral potency of a cinematic interpretation of Bible narratives. And it will therefore be much more difficult to allow the words of scripture to shape your imagination. God gave us words, a truth bomb there. And it, I shared it on my social media. Many people did. And then it started a conversation and Dr. Annual uh, on his By the Waters of Babylon podcast explained how this was really a second commandment issue. So I wondered if we could talk about that first of all, Dr. Annual. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to a good conversation. Yes, thanks for being with us. So most of us are familiar with the Ten Commandments, and we're just going to acknowledge right off the bat for anyone not aware, it's still for today. Jesus <laughs> fulfilled this the ceremonial laws, and he, the the Ten Moral Laws are still for today. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say they 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 embody uh, universal principles that yeah absolutely apply today. Okay, great. So the first commandment we all know: you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment is about idolatry. And you made your podcast in view of the chosen. And I wondered if you could give us uh, a, an outline of that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, really the fundamental reason that I would uh, avoid a show like this or really any images of God, pictures on the wall, stained glass windows, uh, you know, some people even uh, were making comments on social media. Well, do you uh, do you, do you avoid children's Bibles with pictures of Jesus too? And they they were saying it sort of tongue in cheek, as you know, as if certainly you don't. And my reply is yes, we do. We avoid any images of of God, uh, and it's really rooted first and foremost, fundamentally, in the issue of the second commandment. Is we sort of assume that the second commandment is just a restatement of the first commandment almost. Like the first commandment says, don't worship any false gods. And the second commandment basically says the same thing, but just focuses on idols. When in reality, no, that's not, a, that's not what uh, God is giving us. These are two distinct commandments. The first commandment already takes care of the prohibition against the worship of false gods. So the first commandment deals with who we are to worship. The second commandment deals with how, and specifically in the case of the worship of the true God, how we are not to worship. We are not to worship him through any visual representations, these sort of graven images. Uh, we are not to come to know him that way. Um, and what's interesting, and I, I uh, didn't deal with this in my own podcast, but uh, even the numbering of the Ten Commandments differs between, for instance, Roman Catholics and Protestant traditions in the Reformed tradition. Uh, Roman Catholics combine the first two commandments into one because they don't want to see that second commandment as a prohibition of visual images of, of the divine. And then they separate, I think, do, do not covet your neighbor's house and do not covet your neighbor's wife as two separate commandments. So they still end up with 10. When we got to the Reformation, Calvin and others, especially in the Reformed tradition, went back to the traditional numbering and saying, no, the first two commandments are distinct commandments. And the second commandment then is uh, prohibiting 
uh, worship of God, certainly, but even things that would lead us to worship uh, that are visual representations of God. And, and, and so, you know, uh, I would argue, and again, I'm not, this is not anything new. This is, this has been argued at least since Calvin in the sort of that Reformation tradition that we ought not uh, visualize God, any persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, or Spirit, in a visual way, uh, even if we're saying, I'm not, I'm not worshiping that actor, or I'm not worshiping that picture. Okay, I believe you. You, 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 you know, I believe that you're not intending to do so. But the fact of the matter is that we cannot help to actually visualize then. When, when I visualize Christ, I have that actor in my mind. And when I'm worshiping Christ, I am really worshiping that, that graven image. I'm worshiping that physical form. I had the same concern with the Passion of the Christ years ago, with any of these Jesus movies. Uh, these are all uh, breaking this commandment, which God has given to us for a very specific reason. Uh, you know, Calvin said, our hearts are idol factories. We naturally create idols. We don't need to make it any worse by actually viewing and visualizing God through these sorts of, of physical images, we, our hearts are naturally drawn then to worship the visual rather than to worship the God who is, who is spirit and does not have a body like man. Uh, Christ, of course, does have a body now at his incarnation, and he will always have a body, but we, we don't see him. One day faith will be sight, one day we will worship Jesus and we will see his body and we will worship the person of Christ. But to have a picture or an actor uh, visually represent the person of Jesus Christ, our hearts naturally end up then worshiping those images rather than worshiping the true God. That's kind of the core of the second commandment. Yeah, I completely relate and I'm so grateful to you for breaking this down, Dr. Annual, because uh, when I was first saved and people who've watched my videos and they know I had pictures of what I thought were Jesus all around my office. I was raised in a false church, Christian science that had that old fashioned um, European. Yes. <laughs> I think the, I can't remember. There was some story of his royalty son uh, as Jesus. And so that was in my mind as the picture of Jesus. And I didn't think anything of it. And the Heidelberg catechism, the Holy Spirit used to, um, to convict me. And mm, it was question 97. If I'm just going to read it real quick. May we then not make any image at all. The answer God cannot and may not be visibly portrayed in any way. Creatures may be portrayed, but God forbids us to make or have any images of them in order to worship them or to serve God through them and lists um, these. And here's on the screen. These, in addition to the 10 commandments in Exodus, there's other verses that are yeah. in view. Once I was convicted by the Holy Spirit, I had to be honest that when I saw my paintings of supposed Jesus on the wall, I would say, hi, Jesus, to them. Mm, yeah. I would say, good morning, Jesus, to these paintings. And that's a form of worship, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and you can't, and, and even when you're not looking at them later, when you're reading your Bible, when you're reading about Christ, when you're listening to a sermon about Christ, when you're singing a hymn about Christ, you can't help but visualize that image and really then you're ending up worshiping that image. Uh, I, I'm glad you quoted from the Heidelberg too, because it makes a really important point. Some of the commenters on social media were caricaturing what I was saying and, and saying, well, the, the Bible itself allows for images. And they would point to, for instance, in the, in the um, prescriptions about the tabernacle and the temple that God allowed pictures of angels or pictures of trees and pomegranates and these sorts of things. And they were using that to say that my position was unbiblical or inconsistent, but the Heidelberg Catechism says it so well as it does in so many things. The prohibition is not against any images whatsoever. It is against images of God. Absolutely, we can have pictures of trees and pom pomegranates. And, uh, you know, we've got story Bibles at home that don't have pictures of Jesus or God, but they have pictures of other things that help children, you know, that, you know, give children interest or whatever. Um, and even other people, right? We can picture other people because we're not worshiping those things. We're not using them as an aid to worship. But when we, when we visualize Christ, we, that is an aid to worship. Even some people might deny that. Uh, no, I'm not using this to worship, but then they'll turn right around and say, 
well, this movie or this show or this picture brings the Bible to life and it deepens my knowledge of God and it deepens my ability to worship him. That very language is both an expression of the fact that you are using those things to worship and ultimately, and this this was my initial concern in, in that tweet, is that it's distrusting the sufficiency of what God has given us. God has chosen to reveal himself through words. There's a reason for that, and we might get into more, more into that in a moment, but we need to trust that. God didn't give us a picture book. He didn't give us a movie. He didn't give us a, a play, right? Drama was very common in, in, the, in the New Testament age, uh, and yet God did not give us drama. He gave us words, and we need to trust the sufficiency of what God has given us as the means through which we come to know God and as the means through which we come to worship him. Thank you so much for breaking this down and for being just having such a clear biblical stance for the sufficiency of scripture. It's so refreshing. And if God wanted us to know what Jesus looked like, he would have painted a very detailed picture in the Bible, wouldn't he? Right, right. Absolutely. Yeah. Because some, that, that's another uh, a point to, to park on for a moment. You know, some people, would, maybe some people would understand, okay, we shouldn't picture God the Father because he doesn't have a body, or we shouldn't picture the Spirit because the Spirit is a spirit. Um, although maybe people would picture him as a dove or something, but they would say, but Jesus had a body. Uh, God, ga God gave us a picture of Jesus in the physical incarnation, the physical form of God. And, and that's true. Jesus did take on flesh. He does have a body and he will have a body for all eternity. But at the same time, like you just mentioned, as I alluded to earlier, uh, we don't know what he looked like. Uh, and even if we did, I, you know, well, I would say there's a reason God hasn't given us that, right? I mean, could God have stuck a, a little photograph in the Bible? He could have, of course, but I think he didn't because we would naturally then worship the image. And we see this, right, with the, the Shroud of Turin, right, with this, you know, the, the supposedly the, you know, the burnt on image of Christ. Well, what, what ends up happening? People worship that or any of these relics that people um, you know, in Roman Catholicism believed to be, uh, you know, Christ, you know, um, images of Christ or even images of, of, other, of other Christians, we, again, Calvin was right, our, our hearts are idol factories. We naturally tend to worship the creature rather than the creator. And so God has given us things like the second commandment and other prohibitions of visual images of him, I think, because one of the reasons being he, he, he doesn't want it to make it harder for us. It, it's already hard for us. We already tend to worship idols. And so when we visually depict God, uh, we naturally end up worshiping that image. Thank you. That's so helpful. And so that brings us back, of course, specifically to the chosen and yeah. your point that when you watch the chosen, and especially those who are not grounded in scripture, those who right. say that they're almost using um, the chosen, like some people use a devotional as an alternative to scripture, aren't they? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's what some people will say. Well, this is, this is an aid to understanding the Bible, or this is a devotional age, just like, just like any other. And there's, there's several problems with that. But again, one being the difference between, <clears throat> and I think this is fundamental, this, this is one of the reasons God gave us the second commandment. There's a difference between words and pictures. Uh, this is another thing that came up in some of the comments. People were, were saying, well, the Bible's filled with pictures. You've got metaphors, you've got symbolism, you have allegory. And yes, that is absolutely true, right? Uh, and even, just, even pictures of God, metaphors of God. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. That is, that is a picture, but it is a word picture, which is different from a visual picture. People don't understand the difference between what words do and what pictures do. And actually my wife uh, uh, posted on this. My wife has her PhD in education and one of her main areas of study is literature and how um, and how ideas are communicated through through this, these sorts of things. And part of her dissertation, uh, she dealt with this very issue about how when we read words, when we read literature like the Bible, and it contains uh, metaphors, well, what happens when that happens? We read that, we read the Lord is my shepherd, 
And then within our own imagination, we form this conception of who God is. That's the intent of it. God wants to communicate his care of us and the way that he protects us from danger and the way that he meets our needs. And so in order to do that, he uses the metaphor of a shepherd and that helps to, uh, that helps to form our conception of who he is. But when we view a picture or a TV show or a movie, we are viewing someone else's interpretation of God, of Christ, of these, these sorts of spiritual realities. And so we are not, our imagination is not being shaped and formed by words. We are being shaped and formed by other people's imagination. And so even if we say, well, this is a devotional aid, the problem with that is we are relying on someone else's interpretation of scripture. And I think we'll, we'll get into this in a moment. In the case of a chosen in particular, an errant uh, interpretation of, of scripture and allowing that to, to shape our conception. When we read a devotional or when we listen to a sermon, we're still dealing with words. And so uh, you know, it might be possible, right, that you might read a devotional or you might listen to a sermon that might present an incorrect interpretation of scripture. But it's far easier to uh, to, to sort of sift uh, a, a sermon or the written word through scripture than it is to with visual images. Visual images are far more visceral. They don't go through our minds. They immediately impact um, our, 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 our bodies, our physical responses. And, and they do so often without thought. I mean, you can sort of rationally pick things apart, but you can't get away from the way that it is viscerally impacting you. And so it's very difficult. And again, this was the whole point of my tweet. When we view this visual image of Christ, it is shaping us in a, what I called a cinematically visceral way that then makes it far more difficult to allow scripture to shape us. So you watch that show, or you watch The Passion of, of, of the Christ, or you watch any of those Jesus movies, and then you come to read about Christ in the Gospels, you cannot help but then interpret what you're reading through the lens of that, when it really should be the opposite way. You can't help but visualize that, the, the moods, the way that Jesus is interacting with his disciples, all of which is beyond what scripture tells us and is an interpretation, right or wrong, it is interpreting scripture and we're allowing that to impact us first. We're allowing that visual image to influence our interpretation of scripture rather than the other way around. And that's how we can't help it. That's how visual imagery works, which is entirely different from the written word. Amen. Thank you very much for emphasizing this. It's so important, you guys. And um, we're not trying to take away someone's fun. I know these are entertainment, and it seems like it's harmless Christian entertainment, but it can harm someone. It can cause a brother or sister to stumble yeah. if you invite them to watch The Chosen and they don't know God's word enough to compare what's being taught there to scripture, which brings us to um, the point that you brought up, and that is that this is The Chosen is featuring a different Jesus than the biblical true Jesus. Would, yeah. Let's talk about this. I mean, here's yeah. here's a, two clips, and I'm not going to show the whole Jesus here because I don't want to be guilty of a two CV, but here's Jesus supposedly telling in The Chosen, Nicodemus and the woman at the well to follow your heart. It's this another one of your born-again mysteries. Maybe is the kingdom of God really coming? What does your heart tell you? I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon, just the heart. <laughs> And so Jesus in the Bible never told people to follow your heart, did he, Dr. Aniel? Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you have so many issues here. I mean, even just on the level of content, when you're putting words into Jesus's mouth that Jesus didn't even say, you're disobeying the commands at the end of the book of Revelation now. Uh, you, are, you are adding to what 
the scriptures teach, and that's dangerous in and of itself. Even if even if the words you happen to put in Jesus' mouth happen to be correct, you're it's still you're still on walking on dangerous ground. And then when you start to add, you know, put words in Jesus's mouth or, or even the apostles mouth for this matter. So we're, we're going beyond second commandment violations. We're now going into the, the, the realm of communicating things that are beyond scripture as if they are scripture and communicating things that actually contradict scripture, like this quote of, of follow your heart and these sorts of things. What we need to remember is this, and this is something we've, we've lost. This understanding is lost in our day. Art is always interpretive. So something like a picture or even a story or a movie or TV show for sure is by definition, right? This is, this, these are artistic representations. That's what you're going to hear. Well, this is not scripture. This is an, arti- an artistic rendering of scripture. By definition, art is always interpretive. So in other words, whatever art we're talking about, in this case, the chosen, is the creator's artistic interpretation of scripture. So they are, they are communicating the narratives of the gospel through the lens of their own theological understanding. And what comes out on the other end in the form of a TV show is communicating their conception of Jesus, their conception of scripture. Now, I would have a problem already, even if even if the creator of the show, you know, even if I agreed with him 100% theologically, he's a Reformed Baptist, and we agree, you know, 100% on everything. I would still have a problem because it's a second bi- second commandment violation. We're still adding words to you know, in Jesus's mouths that are not in Scripture. Vi- what happens visually and through words are still different. So, still, all of the things that we've already talked about would still concern me. But in the case of the chosen in particular, we're dealing with, number one, a, a, a Christian, quote unquote, production company that is Mormon. OK, so already my, you know, my antenna, my red flags are, are flying. And I, I posted a quote from the creator in which he talked about the Mormon, uh, you know, the, he, he said Mormon, Mormonism and, and evangelical Christianity worship the same Christ. And, and people were objecting, oh, you're just guilt by association. No, my concern with the fact that VidAngel is Mormon and my concern with the fact that he said that Mormons and Christians worship the same Christ, my concern is not just association. It's not like, oh, whatever Mormons do is evil. I want to stay away from anything that's Mormon. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is when we're talking about art and particularly art that is supposed to be communicating biblical truth, Artists cannot help but present their own interpretation through the lens of their theological commitments. I would expect that a Mormon production company would produce art, in this case a TV show, that communicates their Mormon values, their Mormon interpretation of who Christ is, their Mormon interpretation of, of, uh, of, of biblical religion. And if the if the creator of this show, who I guess is an evangelical, but if he says that Christians and Mormons worship the same Christ, well, that tells me something about his theological interpretation that, again, gives me cause for concern. So even if the second commandment were an issue, even if the difference between visual and words weren't an issue, even if all those things were set aside, uh, I would still be concerned with this, this particular show because it is presenting a, a false view of Christ that A, goes beyond scripture, and then actually I would argue contradicts scripture because it is presenting a, 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 an in, a theological interpretation of Christ that is contrary to how scripture portrays Christ. That makes so much sense. And the Mormon religion elevates feelings, if I'm uh, remembering this correctly, that yeah. uh, it, you are supposed to take the Book of Mormon, read it, and then go into your feelings. I think they call it the burning bosom right. to see whether it's the truth or not. And right. so it makes sense for Dallas Jenkins and others who have the Mormon influence to have a Jesus portrayed who is focusing on feelings. Right. That That's absolutely the case. Although I might even say you know, a lot of evangelicalism has that same theological yeah. problem, right? Even if you didn't have the Mormon problem, 
Um, if, you know, there's a lot of evangelicalism that has this sort of follow your heart sort of theology, which, by the way, I think is, it might be worth saying here. You know, why is it that so much of evangelicalism has that theology? Many reasons, but part of it is the movies that we watch, is the entertainment that we allow into our lives that, again, viscerally influences us to, you know, to have this sort of understanding of love that is just sort of a follow your heart sort of thing, or, or uh, that, you know, you, you, um, when you come to a decision in, in your life, you know, you just, you just follow your heart. Well, where do we get that? We get that a lot of times through the cinematic visceral imagery that we're allowing uh, to, to shape, to shape our hearts, to shape our conception of, of the world and how we ought to live. So there's so many problems sort of piling on one on top of the, on top of the other uh, that really come down to these two core things, the, the, the second commandment, and then this, this false interpretation, this false image of who Jesus is that is being communicated uh, in, a, in, a, in a show like The Chosen. Yeah, it's dangerous, folks. You've got to stay away from it. And I, I watched one half of the first episode out of curiosity, and I couldn't even get through that first episode. Yeah. Um, the Holy Spirit will convict us when yeah. we pray for discernment, when we pray for God's wisdom as we're watching this. And it like I said, it could cause a brother or sister or your children who are brothers and sisters, and, and they could stumble because of yeah. this. If, at your own house, you've got children, yep. your wife and yourself, what do you use for children's um, bi study Bibles then yeah. without illustrations? Right. Well, our favorite is the, the Child's Story Bible by Catherine Voss. Um, and the first edition that she did had, had some pictures, but no images of Christ. And then I think it's been reprinted, I don't know, two or three times. The, 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 two, the second and third edition, whoever published it, I think it was Erdman's, did put pictures of Christ in. And, and my wife and I for years were like, we want to find those original, edition, uh, original editions. Well, Banner of Truth just last year published a new edition, uh, and it has a couple pictures, maybe a dozen, not very many, no images of Christ. So it's wonderful. Um, but even there, you know, I think images of, you know, images of other things or whatever are fine, but most we we've come to the place where, uh, you know, even we're, we're currently reading that Bible with our children in the evenings. And even when a, when a picture comes up, I don't sit there and turn it around and show the kids. They, you know, they've, they've learned to listen, right? We want them to listen to yes. the word of God, or even if it's a, a summary of the word of God, we want to train them to listen to words. And so we've, over the course, we've got four children. The oldest is 15 and the youngest is four. Really through, through the 15 years of our parenthood, we've, we've sort of even transitioned to where, you know, we don't even want to use images at all. Let's train our children to listen. Let's train them to listen to words and then to allow their own imaginations, their own conception of God and these biblical narratives and of, and of truth uh, to be shaped by, by the words of scripture. I love it. Renewing their mind at a young age. That's right. This is something yeah. we should all aspire to. Yeah. So the the chosen in this in season two of the chosen, their supposed Jesus says that he's starting a revolution and invites everyone to partner with him in the healing of yeah. the world. Well, that sounds like new apostolic reformation right there. Yeah, right. And that's the thing. I don't know a lot about uh, Dallas Jenkins, but from what I've read, I mean, even just his very uh, you know, misleading statement that Mormons and Christians worship the same Christ lets me know he's not a very astute theological thinker for him to say that. Uh, so, you know, my guess is he's a, he's probably a typical sort of broad evangelical. And so it doesn't surprise me either that sort of health and wealth prosperity gospel, I'm sure is influencing his interpretation. You know, like you said, the new apostolic kind of idea, um, all of these things uh, uh, are by by default going to impact how he portrays Christ. I mean, I, you know, I've not watched any of it. I've read a little bit about it. I mean, I'm really curious. I'm not, not, not in a good way, in a, in a really fearful way. When they get to the cross, how are they going to portray that? Um, I mean, not only, again, is it going to be a, a, a gross violation of the second commandment, but, you know, what, what theology of the atonement is going to be portrayed through this uh, artistic interpretation. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, I, I'm sure I'm, I'm sure it's going to be quite 
you know, quite dangerous and quite damaging, even to well-meaning evangelical, maybe even reformed Christians who are watching this show, they are going to be, their, their, their theology of salvation and the atonement is going to be impacted and shaped. Can somebody like rigorously, you know, kind of compare it to scripture and be like, no, that's wrong. No, that's wrong. Yeah, you can. Although even there, you're going to be influenced. But if you're doing that, like if you're sitting in the living room watching the show with your Bible and you're criticizing it, I would, I would want I would ask, well, why are you watching it to begin with? Right. And that's actually not, I mean, I'm seeing well-meaning Christians on social media who I know who are otherwise discerning conservative people. And they're saying things like this deepens my faith. This deepens my understanding of Jesus and his ministry and who he was. And, and that's so dangerous. They don't, they don't understand how, anti-biblical their own thinking and their own conception of Christ is becoming because they're watching this interpretation of Christ, this artistic presentation of Christ that is so theologically problematic. Yes. Thank you for warning everyone so clearly, Dr. Aniel, and including the actor who supposedly portrays Jesus is a fervent Catholic no. And he also has a strong affinity um, to the New Age through he, he is a Knights Templar. And in 2020, wow. he was nominated for Papal Knighthood. He claims to have interactions, personal interactions with a deceased Catholic saint. The actor credits his Catholic faith as the foundation of his portrayal of Jesus. Now, okay. Roman Catholicism has a different view of Jesus, don't they? Right, absolutely. Again, an, an uh, acting, an artist, uh, or an actor, this is art, and art by definition definition is interpretive. So even if he didn't say, which I'm, I mean, it's, it's honorable that he's acknowledging this, that his Catholic faith is influencing his portrayal. Even if he didn't say that, even if he didn't intend that, it would be. You can't help it. An artist cannot help but communicate his or her own theology through the art that they that they uh, that they produce, so it's not surprising. And yes, absolutely. If we're talking about a portrayal of Jesus Christ, um, are there maybe some common statements that a Roman Catholic might make about Christ and that a Protestant might make make about Christ? Well, yes, but there's also a lot of difference, right, in in who Christ is, in what he accomplished, or or in the case of Roman Catholicism, what he in, in a sense failed to accomplish. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of difference between the Christ of Roman Catholicism and the Christ of Scripture, uh, and I you know I didn't know that about him as an actor, but I remember reading about this and studying this back when the Passion of the Christ came out because Mel Gibson is a committed Catholic, and and this was an issue with that movie as well. And I remember reading specific things about what he did in that movie, all the way down to, you know, when when they nailed Jesus to the cross, apparently. The, the hand that was holding the nail and the hand that was hammering it, that was Mel Gibson's hands because he saw this as almost a meritorious sort of thing, that he was participating in the sufferings of Christ. Right? That's just another illustration about how a Roman Catholic theology of the atonement, a Roman Catholic theology of Jesus Christ is by necessity going to impact this artistic portrayal of Christ and the cross. And so we would expect no different from this actor or from Jenkins or from this Mormon production company. Uh, talk, you know, talk about a, a mishmash of different theologies. We've got, we've got Mormonism, squishy evangelicalism, and Roman Catholicism all contributing to this, this image of Christ portrayed in The Chosen. Uh, it, boy, that's just, it's scary. It's scary how influential then that errant image of Christ from all of those different sources is impacting well-meaning good Christians, and they, they perhaps don't even realize the way that it is shaping them, so that when they go to the scriptures, when they open the Bible, when they read about Christ, they are now interpreting this passage of scripture as if they have a Mormon, a squishy health and wealth evangelical, and a Roman Catholic whispering in their ears, influencing the way that they read about Christ in the very pages of scripture. That's a very dangerous position to be in. Very dangerous. And of course, Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians that the devil masquerades as an angel of light. 
could this be a case where the there's a satanic influence trying to uh, second Timothy four uh, tickle itching ears in yeah. the last days through yeah. so-called entertainment like this. Right. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, this is more dangerous than say a, a TV show or a movie that is sort of overtly atheistic and is, you know, right in your face arguing an atheist position, right? That, I mean, that's, that's anti-scriptural. I wouldn't recommend people go and immerse themselves in that. But actually, what we're talking about, a false view of Jesus that pretends to be Christian, that masquerades as Christian, that, as you say, is in, is in a way sort of an angel of light, right? It, it, it slips in unawares, is more dangerous to our proper conception of God and our proper worship of God than something that is overtly attacking God. That's more easily defensible. I can, I can look to a, a, you know, somebody who says there is no God. I can more easily, for instance, defend against that in, in, in its attacks against my children than if I let my children watch The Chosen. And I'm seeing friends of mine on social media, who they as a family, they sit and watch this. And I'm thinking, what are you allowing into your children's heart and lives? You, you are allowing this false view of God to shape your children's conception of God. And I think you're right. I mean, the, Satan is not, uh, Satan is no dummy. He's learned a lot over his years of, of temptation and attacks against, against God and his Christ. And Satan knows that if he can get well-meaning Christians to just wholeheartedly embrace something and even say, this is a help to my Christianity, when in fact it is actually portraying a false view of Christianity, Satan knows that that is going to damage the church from within. And I think that's happening. It happened with the Passion of the Christ. It happened with, it's happened over the years with these various Jesus shows and Jesus movies. And for some reason, I guess, I guess because of the production value is what I'm reading uh, of The Chosen, uh, it's just really catching on and becoming sort of virally popular among among even evangelical Christians. Uh, and you know, again, Satan knows what he's doing. He Satan knows that you know back in the day when the Jesus movies were just really cheesy and not a whole lot of production value, you know they didn't catch on. He knows that if something can be produced that has the the cinematic quality of Hollywood that it's going to be even more powerfully destruction, uh, d destructive. Uh, and I think that's exactly what's happening with, with this show. So that makes so much sense. This is spiritual warfare. This is um, Ephesians 6 right here. Yeah. And so the way that people are arguing in favor of the chosen and arguing when you post about um, yeah. criticisms of the chosen, I get the pushback too. It reminds me of people arguing for their addiction. And mm. they seem to be very closed down to any kind yeah. of reasoning or just logical de discourse based on scripture. Right. Yeah. I saw somebody, somebody commented on that on Twitter, like, you know, what this whole thread reveals is that people love their idols. Uh, and isn't there an irony there? I mean, I am arguing at its foundation, all these other things, right. I think are important and valuable to talk through, but I am arguing at its foundation that this is problematic because it is a second commandment violation which was given to us by God in order to prevent idolatry. It was given to us by God in order to, to, in order to prevent us from attempting to worship him through a visual form that we end up worshiping, which is exactly what's happening. Uh, you're right. I mean, I, my, my wife and I had a conversation about this because we're seeing friends of ours who, you know, on, on so many things we agree um, and they might even disagree with me on other things, but they do so, you know, just sort of, hey, I disagree with you. Let's have a conversation. And then all of a sudden with this issue, it's like the claws come out and they, there's unwillingness to listen and sort of a condemnation of someone like me that you're being legalistic and you're being judgmental. There's sort of a vitriol that you don't see with some other issues, which just reveals that their hearts are just knit with this, uh, which is scary because it reveals idolatry. It reveals a lack of trust in the sufficiency of scripture. Uh, if, if something, if, if, if they want to make the claim that, no, I'm not worshiping these things, and no, these are things that, you know, just are aids to my understanding of scripture. If that's true, 
then then you wouldn't be so vehemently and strongly uh, defending them as if you know as if they are your god, which is what the, the the kind of language that we're seeing. That's exactly how it's coming across uh, with a sort of angst and um, emotional fervor that you don't see with a lot of other things. Uh, so I think you're exactly right. This is, this is revealing idols. Um, it, it, you know, which, which is what addiction is, right? Addiction is, is you're, you're so, your, your heart is so knit with something that you just cannot give it up. Uh, and Paul, you know, Paul in, in first Corinthians eight through 10, he, even dealing with something like meat offered to idols, he, he deals with this. And, you know, even something like meat offered to idols with which Paul says is not, you know, meat is just meat. Paul does make the point, but if this controls you, if this is, if this is so important to you that you cannot even have a conversation with it, even if it isn't a sin, get rid of it, remove it. And I would say that to people who are so vitriolically, uh, defending their right to view this show, even if it wasn't a second commandment violation, and even if all, if all these other things weren't a problem, it's controlling you, and that's a that's an, an also a very dangerous position to be in because I think you're right. It is, it is sort of an addiction, and uh, and that's that's a danger to be sure. It is, and you know uh, Jeremiah seventeen nine, the heart is deceitful, yeah. and we can't trust our heart. Can we? Right. That's that's what uh, Calvin was getting at when he says our heart, mm-hmm. our, our hearts are idle factories. Right. Uh, that's already natural within us, within our sinful flesh, uh, and so we don't want to do anything to to feed that. Uh, we don't want to do anything that will feed our natural inclination towards heart deception or heart idolatry or heart addiction. We want to avoid that, and the way to avoid that is once again keep coming back to this. But this is. This is like the foundational theological truth for so many things, and that is trust in the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. There's a reason why all of the major confessions of faith begin with the sufficiency of Scripture, because if you if you get that right, a lot of things will fall into place. If you get that wrong, a lot of things become problematic. And I think, I mean, that to me is, is what this whole thing is revealing. That there is an even deeper, more fundamental issue within a lot of evangelicalism. Most of evangelicalism doesn't really believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. That doctrine has to be recovered. We make much of the inerrancy of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture, really important doctrines. We make much of the authority of Scripture. I think all evangelicals would say that Scripture is our authority. Sufficiency is a doctrine that is not developed very well within evangelicalism. People might give it lip service, but something like this issue is revealing. They might give it lip service, but they truly, they truly don't trust in the sufficiency of what God has said. We need these other things. Uh, and that actually, that my, my tweet about the chosen, there was one that came before it two days before it. And it was more generally, I said something like, when we say things like such and such brings the Bible to life, we are evidencing a distrust in the sufficiency of scripture. And something like the chosen is just an extension of that, is just an application of that. No, let's trust the sufficiency of what God has given to us. He has given to us 66 inspired, inscripturated, authoritative, and profitable books of the Bible let us trust that. You want to know God? You want to grow in your and in, in deepen your worship of God? You want to truly worship Christ? Go to the Word. You don't need this other stuff. You don't need pictures. You don't need paintings. You don't need images. You don't need a play. You don't need a skit. I mean, I even I even don't like when pastors put power, you know, pictures in, in the PowerPoint. You know, it's one thing to put words like an outline up there, but when they show pictures or you have this kind of moving imagery behind things, we're not we're not trusting the sufficiency of words. Let's trust the sufficiency of the words that the Holy Spirit of God inspired. His words will not return void, he tells us. 
The Holy Spirit of God will sanctify us. The Holy Spirit of God will deepen our knowledge of God. The Holy Spirit of God will deepen our worship through the words that he breathed out. And so let's trust the sufficiency of the word. That that's that's my biggest burden in all of this. That's the bottom line. And the time that is involved with watching the chosen could be invested in a family Bible study. Yes. So, you know, time's valuable and we need to be sure that we are investing it um, responsibly by yeah. in right. being in God's word. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this is not to say we uh, devotional aids cannot be helpful. They can, or theology books cannot be helpful. But again, they're expounding scripture and they're doing so through words, which again is different than images. Um, and I would also, you know, be quick to say, this is not to say you can never watch a TV show or you can never watch a movie. Or there's not value in, in entertainment or, or leisure. Those are all good things. Um, but I, frankly, I would rather watch a wholesome TV show that has nothing to do with scripture than a TV show about scripture that is going to give me an extra biblical interpretation of scripture, right? If my point is just entertainment, then I'll go watch something that's just some wholesome, you know, show about a, you know, a, a farmer or a veterinarian or a family or something, yeah. you know, but if, but, but when it's scripture, Right. And this is where I would even extend past just even movies or TV shows about Christ. I don't want to watch a TV show or a movie about Noah's Ark. I don't want to watch a TV show or a movie about, you know, David and, and all these sorts of things. Because when it gets to scripture, I want to allow the sufficient word to speak to me. Um, and, and, you know, I, I remember years ago, my wife and I were first married and, and I maybe didn't have as strong as convictions as we're talking about today. Uh, went over a friend's house and we watched one of these Bible movies and it was wholesome. And, you know, the argument was, well, this is, this is good. This is helpful. But I just remember being so disturbed in that now, every time I go back to those biblical narratives, I'm not going to help, but be able to, to, to view them in light of this cinematic interpretation. Uh, it, it might not have an image of God or Christ. It might not be a second commandment violation, but it is still going beyond the sufficient word. It is still visual versus words, which is we talked about earlier is different. And so it is viscerally impacting me. It is shaping my conception of that biblical narrative apart from scripture, sometimes contrary to scripture. And I cannot help then from that point on uh, I cannot help but interpreting scripture in light of that cinematic interpretation. And so I just want to avoid any cinematic uh, artistic portrayal of any of scripture, let alone portrayals of God or Christ. Amen. I just want to say from my personal testimony that decades before I was saved, I was watching Bible movies and they mm. didn't save me. So these are not, these are not salvific portrayals. They, yeah. these cannot save us. Um, and so in addition to all these issues that Dr. Annual is talking about, there's just no value in investing time into these, as Dr. Annual is emphasizing, can influence what we think about as we are in God's word. And that's a dangerous ground to tread on. And it's just nothing that we want to experiment with or think, well, I'm better than that. And I'm the exception. And uh, that, that would be pride. And what does the yeah. Bible say? That pride goes before the fall. So um, if this video is convicting to you, fantastic. We pray that God uses this video for his glory. And we also invite you to pray for God's wisdom and discernment on this topic and, uh, and go to God's word and specifically go look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus again and pray on them and pray you know, because that's why Jesus had to come, because we all break the Ten Commandments. He's the only one who was sinless in his earthly ministry, and he died for us. So we don't want to be doing a sin that our Lord and Savior died for. And that would be the second commandment of idolatry with the chosen. Right. Yep. Amen. I say amen to all that. And, uh, you know, I, again, I think there are a lot of well-meaning people who've been sort of caught up in this, uh, and a lot of this is the failure of pastors and teaching clearly on the second commandment, teaching clearly about the sufficiency of the word. And so I pray that a, a video like this and other discussions that are happening online will once again cause people to go back to the word, trust the sufficiency of the word, and, and rely on the Holy Spirit's use of his word to sanctify us rather than 
uh, sort of visual interpretations, visual images. Amen. And thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Annual. I know that you are so busy and for you to take yeah, the time for this interview is just very humbling and appreciated. Yeah, it was my honor. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you.